So uh, welcome everyone to our webinar on bikeway design. Uh, it seems like this is a topic that a lot of advocates are um, have expressed interest in just getting knowledge about what are what are the different options, what are the possibilities for designing bikeways in their community. So we we wanted to dedicate a webinar to this topic. So just a little background, uh, we're from the Active Transportation Alliance. Uh, it's a nonprofit. We advocate for walking, biking, and public transit uh, to create healthy, sustainable, equitable, equitable communities for the entire Chicagoland region. And uh, my name is Maggie Malin. I'm the Suburban Advocacy Manager. Uh, and uh, this webinar is part of our Bike Walk Every Town series, uh, which is our suburban advocacy program, and REI and UIC are our sponsors, so thanks to them for for that, and we're recording this, so and we'll post it on YouTube afterwards, so um, in case you weren't able to make it or you want to share this with anyone, it will be available for you. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, during the webinar today, you can either, so if you're on the Skype version of the webinar, there's there should be that symbol, should be somewhere on your webinar screen. On mine, it's at the bottom left. You can click that. You can type in any questions or comments you have uh, throughout the webinar, and we'll address questions at the end. Um, or if you're not on the um, Skype and you're just listening in today, you could email me. Maggie at activetrans.org, and I'll check those emails uh, after we finish the presentation in case there are any questions uh, that you emailed me. So today we're, we have uh, Ed Versati here. He's uh, from Ride, Illinois. He was formerly the executive director since the early 2000s, 2001, I believe, and um, more recently, he became the chief programs officer uh, in Ride, Illinois, as our state advocacy organization, and we we often work with Ed and his team uh, to improve biking uh, in the region, and um, so I will let him take it from here, and ju just so you know, so today, he'll, he'll be... Um, presenting, he'll be doing the main portion of the pre presentation, then I'll be taking over after to show a few local examples, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, and we are going to be um, switching who has control of the PowerPoint, so there might be a bit of a delay when we switch. Uh, so if, if for some reason you don't see the slides advancing, if someone can just comment in the little comment box just to let us know so we can make sure that works. So Ed, I'll, tr I'll hand it over to you. All right, thanks Maggie. Um, transitioning right now, let's see, you're about to stop the current presentation. I don't, I don't want to do that and become the active presenter. Uh, okay. All right. Um, everyone's been able to enjoy the slide of Pat Quinn looking at the back of my neck. Um, welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Ed Barasati and as Maggie said, I'm with Ride Illinois. Ride Illinois is a statewide bike advocacy organization. We do a lot of stuff on uh, advising towns on what's the appropriate bikeway type in different locations. Um, that might be as a bike plan consultant. In fact, I'm sitting here in Mattoon, Illinois uh, doing a bike plan today. Um, but we also work at the project or at the project and policy level to get roads that are bike friendly. Uh, we work on cyclist and motorist education, such as bikesafetyquiz.com, trails, funding, lobbying, legislation, and so on. So we do a little bit of everything to make biking better. Topics today, uh, I really would like to introduce uh, just some tools and some concepts that would help you with your bike infrastructure advocacy. It's going to be pretty um, rapid fire here. Uh, the, the main purpose is just to introduce you to what's out there. We're certainly glad to help offline as well. And that's going to start off with a discussion of different bikeway types that are available and move on to um, what you might request when there's a road project coming up in your area. So first of all, as, a, as an advocate and, and as, as a 
planners or staff people if you're with a, a government agency. These are three resources that you need for, um, for bikeway design issues. First one on the left is the AASHTO Guide for Development of Bike Facilities. That one costs a little bit more, so you know, if you had to pick two that were free, it's the two on the right. You know, one in the middle is the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide. That's online. And then on the, uh, the far right is the Man Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the National Standards on Signage, as well as, as, well as pavement markings. So those are three good references to have. Um, IDOT has its own manuals. One governs state roadways, and the other governs its approval of local road projects. We're going to go through a whole slew of different bikeway types, starting off with uh, off-road trails on their own rights-of-way. This is what a lot of people think about in terms of bikeways. Clearly, it's not the only one, but it's a very popular one. Um, specialized corridors, rivers, expressways, and so on. These often can form the uh, network of, or the, uh, the backbone of your bikeway network in your town. Another kind of uh, trail are trails that are within a roadway corridor called side paths. Side paths are basically widened sidewalks. Uh, the, uh, the standard is that they're 10 feet wide. You can go 8 feet wide as a variance. You have to have a grass buffer or uh, a retaining wall between the road and the side path. These are these are fine if it's, a, if it's a roadway that generally has higher speeds. Those higher speed roads out in the suburbs, 45 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, they tend to have what's called good access control, where you don't have a lot of side streets, you don't have a lot of commercial crossings or driveways that uh, would interrupt the side path. Because side paths have their problems, and you'll see in the next slide, they have their problems at intersections. So intersection design really is critical, and this sort of treatment is not great, say, in a dense urban core of 30 miles an hour travel and lots of driveways and side streets. So kind of a, a graphic that shows why off-road side paths or sidewalk riding can be more dangerous, um, and it's very counterintuitive to people who don't bike very much. If you take a look, um, you have cars at this intersection wanting to make certain turns. And uh, shaded are kind of their view angles of where they're looking before they make those turns. And in each of those cases, if you're an off-road cyclist, you're not as well seen as a cyclist who's on the roadway, especially if you're a cyclist, too, who's going against the flow of traffic. So this is a very counterintuitive issue for people who don't ride their bikes much. Um, when you're trying to make the case for on-road bike facilities and the elected officials are saying, well, bikes should be off the road, then this is where you can bring up uh, what happens at intersections. And intersections is where most bike car crashes occur. When dealing with on-road, there's just a wide range of subject subjective opinions um, from elected officials and even staff on what is a bike-friendly road. And what I like to do in my work is to use an objective measure to cover that. You know, in one town, for example, in, in Geneva, I had a public works director who probably thought the only bike-friendly road was a cul-de-sac, whereas in Batavia, the public works guy was a triathlete and anything was absolutely fine. So by having objectivity, it, it can help out to make your argument and to prioritize. The measure that I like to use is the bicycle level service measure. It's been around for quite a while. It's based on mid-block roadway geometry, characteristics of the road, and what are the traffic conditions. And it's a perception of safety by a range of cyclists. Here's a website calculator that we put together where you can do the calculations and come up with values, along with good ranges of what the results might be. I will say that um, bicycle level service does have its issues. The model isn't you know, applicable in, in every situation. Um, lately, there's been something called level of traffic stress that's come up. Uh, it has its own disadvantages, enough so that, that I still use bicycle level service. Um, I'm glad to talk with anyone offline about that if you care. So back to different on-road bikeway types now that we have an objective measure to, um, to consider them. The first is just a simple bike route sign. And back, you know, 30, 40 years ago or so, you'd had the one in the, uh, the upper left where it just said bike route. 
lately the tendency is let's try to put some wayfinding information in there. So you have the lower right, I'm sorry, the, uh, the lower left example um, where there's destination information um, and you can even put mileages if you want. That type of sign, that type of bike route sign is now accepted by the national standards. So with bike routes, there is, um, there's really no constraints on what types of road that you use it. It just indicates that this is a preferred route in your network. So it can be a road with stripes or without stripes, with parking, without parking, different widths, and so on. And that flexibility can help out. You'll see a little bit later in this, uh, this presentation. So we'll move on to bike lanes. And bike lanes are actually dedicated space for bikes on each side of the road, usually five or six feet. These are good um, in some of the lower speed roads, but not, you know, you wouldn't put this on like a very quiet residential road typically. It might be the, the slightly busier road that are called collectors or even the, the even further busier road called arterials. And it's been shown that this type of facility does attract cyclists, it does bring more people bicycling, and it, in, it in, improves safety by having more bicyclists bike on the correct side of the road instead of contra flow. So there's definitely some advantage with the bike lanes. It, it's, not, you know, it's not the answer in every situation, and you have to watch out for issues around parked cars. There are some tricks involved with that that I'm glad to discuss offline. If you have the extra room, and this is actually one of the tricks, if you have the extra pavement room, you can add buffers to your bike lane. And those buffers could be on the parking side or it could be on the travel lane side. And there's reasons of doing uh, one or the other uh, where you might put, um, which side you might put it on if you only have room for one buffer. Protected bike lanes, also called cycle tracks, they probably have two or three other names as well. This is what we're seeing a lot more in downtown Chicago. Downtown Aurora has a prominent one right now. Um, essentially, this is kind of like a side path on a dense um, urban type of roadway where it's part of the same pavement, but there's a physical separation of some type, whether bollards or a raised um, a median sort of a, a barrier or different things. So there's, there's physical separation and it significantly adds to the perceived comfort level by a much broader range of cyclists. So we're seeing great results around the country, especially in dense urban cores of this sort of a treatment. Um, intersection design is just absolutely critical. And in my mind, actually, this sort of treatment in more suburban type locations, the jury is still kind of out on it, again, in my opinion. And the reason for that is I think that when you have a situation where um, motorists are expecting to see crosswalk users, pedestrians and so on, it is in those situations where um, cars will stop at the stop line. If there's usually no one in a crosswalk, then they, then they will stop in front of a stop line at an intersection. And that location might in fact even be in your protected bike lane. So especially if that motorist off the side street is going to be turning right, they may, may not be looking for a user in a cycle track. And I, I think in suburban locations, it's certainly something to be more aware of. So again, intersection design really is the key. The NACTO guide does a great job of explaining how to try to alleviate some of those intersection issues. But if you can achieve it, this is certainly a bikeway facility that has been shown to be very popular. Shared lane marking. So this is um, also called Sharrows. This helps out in a couple ways. Indicates to drivers that this particular lane is going to be shared, uh, maybe more so than other roadways, with cyclists. And it also tells cyclists where to position yourself so you don't get doored when a parked car, parallel parked car, the driver opens the door of that parked car. So with a Shero, you can position uh, you can position where bikes should be farther out, centered 11 feet out at least from the curb, if not more. Uh, so this this sort of treatment really should not take the place of bike lanes or buffered bike lanes or so on, but they can serve as a fallback position if you don't have the pavement width. 
you really shouldn't have a shared road, a shared lane markings road that lasts for a long time. You should try to find something else that could be done. But shared lane markings can certainly serve a purpose, a fallback position, where you may not have enough room. For example, bike lanes. When you have bike lanes, often you have a, you have a turn lane at intersections. When you have maybe a red light intersection up ahead, there might be a turn lane. So suddenly the road, which was very wide, wide enough for bike lanes away from the intersection, suddenly now there's three lanes and you don't have that same amount of room and they have to drop the bike lane temporarily. In that case, shared lane markings can serve, um, serve the, the purpose of getting you through that intersection. And there'll be a graphic of that a little bit later on. Shared lane markings, there's different experimental treatments that can be done to increase the visibility of that. The city of Chicago has done a great job of advancing the science on some of these sort of treatments. All right, All right. Um, going back to the idea that bike lane signage can provide a lot of flexibility. Out in the suburbs, there's a lot of these very wide residential roads, maybe 18, 19 foot lanes or so, where um, people speed on it because it's so wide, but the residents want to have parking alongside of the road in case they have a party at their house. That parking generally is not occupied very often at all. It's probably less than 5% occupancy, but when you have a party at your house, you want to have someone be able to park on your side of the road. It's just the suburban the Bill of Rights, I think, in the suburbs. And I, I live in the suburbs, so I can say that. Um, so in that case where you don't have the political will to remove parking on one or both sides and install bike lanes, then a fallback treatment might be simply to add striping along that roadway. And that striping serves three purposes. One, it acts, it, it provides it's essentially like a shoulder, an urban shoulder, where people who do park their car can feel a little more secure about doing so. Two, it actually does what's called passive traffic calming, where it narrows the travel lanes, and that slows down speeding, especially the high-end speeders. And then the third is that it provides cyclists with a place where they might feel a little more secure biking. If there's a car that's parked there, they would go around that car exactly as they would if there were no stripe there. This sort of treatment only works if you have very sparse parking occupancy and if the traffic counts are fairly low. Otherwise, you shouldn't do it. You don't want bikes to be crossing that white line when there's traffic coming very often at all. So again, fallback treatments often will serve a purpose because the ideal is rarely met out there in real life. Paved shoulders, more of a rural issue. Um, the width of it should depend on the traffic level and type. There's different uh, advantages for it in addition to bicyclists, but also for motors run off the road crashes. But rumble strips are an issue. Those are increasing more and more, I'll back up, sorry, where road agencies are going to be adding more rumble strips, making noise for run off the road motorists. If the rumble strips are done poorly, there's not enough room for cyclists to be. And that can be more dangerous than not having a shoulder at all. So we, right Illinois, have been advocating IDOT to change the rumble strip design to make sure we have at least enough clear zone um, that, ha that is shoulder space without rumbles. Again, kind of a niche topic. I'm glad to answer more questions offline. Warning signage, if you are unable to add more space, add shoulders, add bike lanes or whatever, but this is a road that might be very popular for cyclists and you want to do at least something, even a minimal something, this is a new sign that uh, we've been advocating is uh, to, to uh, pay attention to the three-foot law. It's a motorist directed sign. We've had several agencies install that, and we're glad to partner with you um, if you want to do that in your agency. Bicycle boulevards, um, those are generally quieter streets. I have a graphic for it where you provide, you provide priority for bikes to get through, but you make it difficult for cars to get through. And you can do that in a number of different ways um, by adding traffic circles, by, uh, by adding diverters, and so on. Um, fairly niche topic. It really has to be a location where you can um, create a bicycle superhighway to a logical destination such as a university. 
advisory dash lanes or advisory dash bike lanes is something coming up fairly new. I won't go too much into that. It is something that um, that is covered by the Federal Highway Administration, and that's what I mean by FHWA. And then finally, intersection markings. On the lower uh, left, you see the uh, you see the shadow in the middle or on the left side of a right turn lane. That's one way that you can get bikes through an intersection when you've dropped a bike lane temporarily. Uh, there are bike boxes, as you see in the middle, and there's other techniques, such as on the right, that you see in Chicago. All right, that was certainly rapid fire, and we're going to move on to the next phase of this, which is um, road projects. When road projects are coming up, it's a great opportunity to try to make it more bike-friendly. And Ride Illinois has devoted a lot of time recently to looking at those upcoming lists, primarily with IDOT right now, um, and then coming up with detailed suggestions of what we think would be improvements that they might be able to achieve within their budget. So certainly we could ask for the Cadillac, we could ask for the ideal, and if there's opportunity, we will. But in this particular um, project, we have been focusing on smaller scale uh, improvements, and I want to detail for you some of those possibilities that we have asked for or that IDOT has done on their own recently. We not only look at upcoming road projects, but we also look at the, uh, at the um, policies as well. So people who are interested in those topics, I sure would love to talk with you offline. Carbondale is an example. Down southern Illinois, they had extra space on one-way roads. The lanes were too wide, and they had enough room when they resurfaced the road, when they repaved it, to add a bike lane on the right side. So that was easy. Didn't force them to make it a wider road. They just uh, changed the position of where the stripes were and where the dashes were. Here's one that we requested uh, up in North Chicago. There's a roadway that we saw from uh, a tool called Strava's bicycle heat map. We saw that this was a popular road with cyclists. Clearly, this was a club-level cyclist because it's a pretty busy road. It's pretty fast travel. Um, and you have these lanes that are 12 feet wide, three on each side. So we asked them simply to uh, narrow the inner two lanes, and that would leave enough room for 14 feet on the right side that being the lane where bicyclists will be. So it's a very minor improvement. It doesn't cost anything. It's just repositioning where you put the dashes. Here's Urbana. Um, it's part of a bike plan there. First implementation was let's do what's called a road diet. A road diet basically means that a road has more lanes than it needs right now. So let's repurpose some of that uh, pavement width for, for more uses. In this case, you see on the right side, after the, after the resurfacing, they uh, had enough room after going down to one lane in each direction. They had enough room for a left turn lane in the middle. That helps to improve motor safety. They were able to put, uh, in, the, in the upper part of that, they were able to put a place where people could cross the road with a median, a raised median, to get to the bus stop. And then they had extra room enough for bike lanes on both sides. So. Again, no extra pavement width, but a lot of good that was accomplished from this. Western Springs is another place that we've asked for a road diet. We've got uh, what looks to be like the Panama Canal of cyclists going over the uh, uh, I-294 right there, as evidenced by our, our Strava heat map. Uh, we saw a lot of bike activity. So we took a look. We saw that the ADT, which is the traffic count, was not all that high. And so our request is to do a study to reduce this to being a three-lane road for just a short distance up to where most cyclists turn off the road anyway. Um, another case the road diet was asked for in Blue Island. This one, the traffic count of 5,000 a day was even lower. Kids are playing in the street. Um, and this was actually in Blue Island's uh, bike plan as well, so hopefully that ask should be a little bit easier. Using that Strava heat map, and if you just Google on Strava, S-T-R-A-V-A, bike heat map, um, that, that is a great way to see where bicyclists are. So we saw, in the case of Wilmington, we saw a short little stretch of 400 feet where cyclists travel instead of on the state road that's on the right side. Um, for its whole length, they only hop on the state road for 400 feet. So. In that case, we ask for some gravel shoulders to be paved. 
that's it. Another one uh, up here in Chicagoland in uh, Willow Springs. Hard to see in this picture, but there are rumble strips covering most of that paved shoulder. This is a case where we believe that uh, it's less safe for cyclists than even having no shoulders at all. If you were to try to ride over those rumbles, you're going to rattle so badly you're likely going to fall. But motorists who are coming from behind are expecting that you're going, well, some of them at least, are going to expect that you head over into the paved shoulder as they approach, some of them maybe even honking their horn. So our our, our uh, assertion is that uh, this is less safe. We made that point in our letter on this, and we're asking them that if they do have to have rumbles, to widen the shoulders a little bit, narrow the rumbles, put it closer to the white line. Here's an issue that's, um, that comes up in town after town where I've done bike plans, and I'm sure that everyone on this phone call has experienced it, where you're on a road that's not all that busy, but it has a stoplight crossing the major road in town or one of the major roads in town. And you as a bike, you're sitting there and you're not able to trigger the green. And you think it's because you don't weigh enough as a bike and you, but it's magnetic. It's more, of a, it's more of a thing of you have to position your bike on the right side of the perimeter, the detector perimeter, to have a good chance of triggering the light. So a lot of people aren't aware of that, um, even engineers and so on. So there's actually a way to indicate where you should position your bike to cause that green to occur. What ends up happening when bikes can't trigger a green? You get cars that come up from behind you, and they think it's polite to stop way in back of you, and no one is able to turn the green, so you just sit there and sit there, which is ridiculous. Um, better thing is for them to scoot up, and I usually try to get them to come closer. But uh, there are tools that can be used in that situation. IDOT has done, by our request and others, they have uh, already done that in the Chicagoland, in Warrenville, at the intersection of Mack Road and uh, Route 59. What you can do is a couple of different things. If there is truly a sweet spot where, you, where your bike can position itself on the perimeter of the detector, then use a paint marking to indicate where that sweet spot is and use the sign on the right of this graphic that tells bicyclists and motorcyclists where to position themselves to, tr to trigger that green. One could go even further and put in a special detector for bikes. I see that in a lot of bike-friendly towns. Boulder, Colorado, it's kind of everywhere. But if you can't get that special detector in, then there is a process by which you can test the existing detector. If it works, to put in that marking, get the sign in. So moving on to uh, off-road treatments, we, we've covered a number of different on-road treatments you might want to ask for in, that, uh, in those requests. Um, but uh, some of the off-road treatments, we, uh, when we looked at upcoming road work by IDOT, we saw uh, on the lower part of this, uh, of this slide, there's, uh, even in the Google images, there's a cyclist riding on this terribly busy road. There's no accommodations. Tinley Park did the typical suburban thing of saying, well, we'll wait for the developer to build it so, you know, we don't have to build it. We don't have to build the sidewalk. And then you get parcels that aren't developed ever or they were developed before the road was redone. So you have these parcels that aren't developed and your sidewalk is, has all kinds of gaps to it. So that was the situation here. And we saw the cyclists there riding in the roadway. Um, so our request when they were going to resurface this is to add a sidewalk. That changes the scope dramatically. It's going to be a much larger project. Our chances for success are probably going to be lower, but we're raising the issue. And with some additional advocacy at the local level, it could be changed around to a success. Um, on the top of this slide, the top graphic, it shows what we call a goat path or a desire line, where there's so many people walking or biking on a place that doesn't have a sidewalk or a side path or anything off-road that you have a worn dirt path alongside of the road. So when you see that, it's a pretty clear indication that the road agency messed up by not adding something off-road. Here's a nasty trend that's coming up of let's develop a parcel, or let's, let's develop the uh, parcel on one of the corners of an intersection 
And uh, because the other parcels are not yet developed, we're going to just have the sidewalk go around and not actually go up to the road itself. So we're seeing more and more of that. It's a bad trend, and we're trying to change it. And by getting involved at the early level in roadway work, or even within your town of knowing what developments are coming in, this can be stopped. Sorry, I'm, the pauses are because I'm getting away from the arrows of the advanced slide thing. Um, what we also see in roadway design, something to point out to your, uh, to your towns, is let's put the sidewalk on the very edges of the right-of-way of this, of this corridor, of, of this roadway corridor. And what ends up happening is your side, in fact, here in Mattoon today, I'm seeing that all over the place, where the sidewalk is way too far back from the intersection. The chances of the cars actually stopping at the stop line is about 0%. So car rushes up from the side street, pulls up to the road, doesn't even look to their right when they want to make a, a right turn on the roadway. They're not looking right for sidewalk users. Um, and it becomes a dangerous situation. So certainly this is something to bring to the attention of your town if there's a major road work being planned. Another off-road thing is what happens at these large suburban style intersections. Um, lately we've seen in recent decades that in an effort to try to get cars to turn more quickly through such intersections, the turning radius of the intersections becomes larger and larger. When that occurs, then the stop line is pushed further back from the crossroad and the crosswalk is also pushed further back. In both cases, um, it becomes a place where cars are not going to obey the stop line very well and you run into, into those same issues again. So what we try to do is advocate for what's called a right corner island. It's also called a pork chop. It's not very visible here, but uh, if you look at the upper left part of the intersection, there's a little triangle, and that's where they have a stoplight. And then behind, above that triangle, they actually have the crosswalk of a major trail. I think it's the North Branch Trail, I'm not sure. Our request on this project was, okay, why don't you go ahead and widen the turning radius a little more there, make it a bigger port chop, and then run the crossing so that it actually uses that port chop, breaks up the crossing, People crossing the road, either on foot or on bike, are only contending with one turning motion at a time. And it improves safety pretty significantly. Cars stop at a stop line location that's more realistic. There's a lot of winds. And if it's done right, you don't have to worry about turning trucks as well. So this is a treatment that could be done, improve those crossings. A good uh, example that I like to point out is the one seen in this slide. This is an Aurora at the intersection of Orchard and uh, Galena Boulevard on the west side of town. Check it out on Google satellite imagery. They, uh, they cross the trail to the uh, pork chop, two different pork chops actually. Uh, they recess it so that they don't have to worry about left turning trucks hitting the pork chop. Um, so it's a, it, is, you know, it is a pretty big intersection, but you get that in the suburbs. This is a way to alleviate the issues that come up with turning radii high being too large. Getting near the end here, I know Maggie's going to start playing the music that I'm going on too long. Um, in certain situations, you may not have enough room to put in a pork chop. Here's an intersection uh, by a Tinley Park trail where we think that to be true. So in that case, there's another treatment that could be done. It's not as good. Where you go up, you get to the, you get to the stoplight if you're a trail user and you push the uh, pedestrian button. Then what happens is um, you get a walk signal for a couple seconds before uh, the cars that are parallel to you get their green light. And the way that'll help, imagine the lower right-hand side, someone coming from the trail on the lower right side wanting to cross to the uh, top right side on that crosswalk. If you get a lead pedestrian uh, interval walk signal for a second or two, then you're going to get a head start before right turning traffic that's going north get, gets a chance to make their turn. So it's a way to help out from that, that inevitable conflict from right turning traffic and trail users. I think this might be the last one. Um, here's a case where the Salt Creek Trail crosses a roadway. 
There's a right turn lane that goes into a parking lot where hardly anyone parks. Well, why not just reuse this roadway and the right turn lane becomes the through lane? You, uh, you block off the middle and, and, and create a, a center-raised median island so people can cross halfway at one time. That actually reduces crashes by 43%. Um, and if you can make the case, certainly here it's a very heavily used trail, um, and it's justified to try to make an improvement such as that. There are treatments that are out there. There are things called uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons uh, that are these strobe lights that you can push as a trail user that help to improve motorist compliance of stopping at these trail intersections. And there's other treatments as well. So again, glad to talk offline. So my last slide, um, just an overall wrap up on infrastructure advocacy and some suggestions that I've, I have from just doing this over the years, is that it's a lot easier to ask for bike-friendly improvements when other road work is upcoming. If you try to go in there and, and, and do a retrofit project, ask them to create an entirely new project just to do something for bikes or something for pedestrians, it's just not going to get as much of a priority. It's going to be a lot harder to do, and it's going to cost a lot more. So um, make the changes. Uh, Everhart knows this from McHenry County as well. Make the changes when other road work is coming up. And the way to find out about that road work is not to see that there's a bulldozer that showed up or that they're, they're now staking out that area or there are surveyors out there. The way to do it is to look online. IDOT has an online list of projects. Most of the county highway departments have that. The towns have something called capital improvement programs where you can find a lot of that information years in advance, and that's when you get involved. When you find out what's out there, find out what the needs are and figure out what are some achievable requests that you can make. Make that request technically appropriate if you can, and that's why it's to your advantage to learn about issues such as this, what are the different bikeway types, what you can ask for, and so on. Um, but try to be realistic. You know, these towns are, a lot of them are fairly poor. Absolutely, as advocates, we'd love to get the Cadillac, we'd love to get the ideal, but often you have to pick your battles and figure out what you can get. So be realistic is my suggestion. And then when you do so, you're going to be talking with engineers who are going to say, oh, we can't do this because IDOT's manual doesn't have that. Well, the truth is IDOT's manual is far behind the national best practice, and they don't have the staff or expertise to update that manual. So don't be satisfied when your city engineer makes that statement. That's, that's honestly a bunch of baloney. Um, there are authoritative national manuals out there the Federal Highway Administration has approved a whole lot of this stuff, even if it's not in the IDOT manuals yet. So in your letter or in your talk with the city council or, or whatever, if you can quote the MUTCD or, or uh, the NACTO guide or AASHTO, if you can quote that, you have credibility and you won't get the brush off, which, is, which happens all too easily for advocates who are not aware of these issues. So that's a whole lot. Thanks for your patience uh, in a quick 35 minutes. Um, Ride Illinois and Active Trans can certainly help and guide your efforts. We're here to do that. Probably one of the favorite part of my job is when there's local advocates with energy that just need that guidance on either technical or strategic approaches, and we're here to help you out. All right. All Thanks. Right. And uh, Maggie, if you can take over. Yeah. All right. I'm going to switch um, to the presenter, so give us a second. And thank you, Ed. Um, thanks for sharing all of that. It's um, a lot of great um, information and knowledge to have to to make us all stronger advocates. Uh, and and I love that that last thing you said about um, you know pushing back when when someone says, oh, it's not in the IDOT manual, because um, I see that a lot too. Uh, and all when I send out an email to everyone who registered for this webinar, I'll include links to the resources that uh, Ed mentioned, so you can um, check those out. Uh, and right now, quickly, I just want to go through a few different local examples of some of the treatments that Ed mentioned. Uh, and also, you know, he th this slide here, he alluded to, 
you know, these all of these different examples of bikeway types. And um, j this is just showing, you know, there's definitely a, a level of comfort um, that changes depending on what type of uh, bikeway design you select. So the sharrows are probably the least comfortable um, for people, although those can be an easy um, treatment to get placed on the ground. Um, and then to the right, having you know separated uh, facilities uh, is much more comfortable for cyclists and you'll get you know more people riding, um, especially younger, uh, younger riders and and older riders and then um, just a few a few thoughts about so what is what makes a street um, bicycle friendly pedestrian friendly uh, you know often you want to have you want bicyclists to be using roads that have slower um, vehicle speeds and volume or lower volume uh, even though you know often that's not the case and so that's why we want to have good facilities uh, on roads that um, that are more higher volume or higher higher um, speeds but um, ideally you're going to be putting that infrastructure on on roads that are more comfortable for people to be on and you you also want those uh you know bikes to be or th those bikeways to be connected you don't want people to just be dropped off in the middle of nowhere or suddenly at an intersection that's impossible to cross so also thinking about um, how do you get people across intersections and big barriers uh and trying you know really thinking about how how can we make our communities uh uh 8 to 80 friendly so something comfortable for an eight-year-old or an 80-year-old. And one thing I just wanted to mention related to uh, vehicle speed is this is a pedestrian infographic, but it can also, you know, you can apply this to bicyclists as well that, you know, bicyclists and pedestrians are vulnerable road users. So uh, at 20 miles per hour, uh, nine out of 10 pedestrians survive a crash, while at 40 mi miles per hour, only one out of 10 pedestrians survives a crash. So again, that's why um, ideally we're putting, um, we're, we're directing bicyclists and pedestrians to lower volume roads. And, and maybe this is a case to slow some of our speeds down on some streets. Okay, so now for a few examples around the region. Um, so Bicycle Boulevard, this is something Ed mentioned. Uh, this is in Brookfield. Uh, they, they, from what I know, they're the first suburban community to have put in a bicycle boulevard in the Chicagoland region. And uh, this treatment, so uh, there, there are different approaches to designing a bicycle boulevard. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of putting large pavement markings on the road, um, or you can it can be a bigger project that includes traffic calming elements and possibly diverters to reduce car traffic. Uh, in Brookfield's case, they got a federal grant to do this, and they included not only all those markings on the road, but they, they improved the entire street and improved a lot of the pedestrian crossings and created some curb bump outs to make it more comfortable for for people walking and biking. Uh, so we, we did a blog post on this, which describes more detail about how they made this happen. So I'll, send, I'll make sure to send that out as well. Uh, the standard bike lane, uh, you know, we do see these more we're seeing more of these uh, in the suburbs, but this is an example in Richton Park. Uh, they, I believe it was last year or the year before, they adopted a bike plan. So they're working on, you know, creating uh, a better network of, of bicycle facilities. And also, if any of you know of some good examples in the suburbs or in your community, feel free to add a comment um, uh, in the comment box so we can just call it out because it's. It, I think it's a. It's helpful to see examples of these types of projects in the suburbs, uh, so you know it's it's possible. It can happen uh, in a place other than a dense urban area. 
Um, this is a buffered bike lane example. This is from Chicago. So Ed mentioned this and um, it's good for the wide suburban streets that can accommodate, that can't accommodate a pr protected bike lane because of driveways. Um, and it, as Ed mentioned, you can have the buffer on either the right side um, where the car parking is or the left side to separate bikes from traffic, or you could do both if there's space as there's space on this road in this example. And this is another example from Chicago. I don't know of any examples like this in the suburbs, but it's a contraflow lane. So this is the idea of it's a one-way street and uh, bicyclists, there's a special lane with a, it's actually, there's a yellow um, divider um, where bikes can go in the opposite direction on that street. Uh, and it just creates, it creates more options for bicyclists and reduces barriers for, um, so they, they don't they, they can go on a quieter street um, in this example, rather than going on a parallel street that's really busy and uncomfortable for bikes. So, um, so an example from Chicago. And then, oh, there's a little, another image of it from one of the um, guides that I think that might be from NACTO. They have a lot of really great images. Uh, so it's a really great resource to get ideas and see examples. Uh, Ed mentioned this briefly. Also, there's something called an advisory bike lane. Uh, there is an example in Chicago on Milwaukee, but um, in the suburbs, I don't know of any examples in the Chicago lane region, but um, there are some examples in Indiana, Minnesota, where it's there's not necessarily enough room to put in a bike lane, uh, but you can put this dashed advisory bike lane so that bikes if a bike's there they they um you know they'll be using that uh that that lane but um the the car the car lane is actually um i i think it's normally 18 feet uh so if another car is suddenly if there are two cars approaching each other that those cars could temporarily go into the bike lane area to pass each other so that's how an advisory bike lane works. Uh, this is an example from Evanston. Uh, it is a protected, uh, parking protected bike lane. You can kind of see it far into the distance in that photo. Uh, this is on Dodge Avenue in Evanston. And the we heard from the engineers there that when they, after installing this uh, protected bike lane, that the cars protect the bicyclists, the parked cars. Um, there was a drop in uh, in crashes of all types and injuries um, after that that um, was installed. And here's another example from Evanston, the protected cycle track. This is on Chicago Avenue in Sheridan. Uh, we just actually did a bike tour. Uh, of Evanston with some municipal staff from around the region to show them different facilities. Uh, and this was a, we, we biked on this. It was really very, very comfortable. Uh, it's really, it's really close to Northwestern University. Um, and it's, it, the, these types of facilities work better uh, when you don't have uh, driveways uh, because that can cause some conflicts with this type of treatment. Uh, and then, of course, side paths and trails are part of a low-stress st network in the suburbs, and they're particularly useful along arterials and busier streets. Um, and you, you're going to want to make sure they're sited to minimize driveway crossings uh, and be wide enough to accommodate not only bicyclists, but also, also pedestrians. So these are some examples from Melrose Park in Brookfield. And these are, you know, I see, definitely see the sidewalks or the side paths as a more common um, treatment in, in many suburban communities in Chicagoland. Uh, and intersection, in, intersection markings, uh, Ed, you know, said that intersections are often the most dangerous uh, parts of the, the road where the crashes most often happen. So making sure there are visible markings to alert drivers 
to the fact that a bicyclist might be there. This is the left example is from Glencoe and the right example is from Skokie with the green paint. So it stands out even more. And here's another a treatment example. So d many different styles and designs, but just some examples for you. And it also mentioned the bike, the idea of having a bike box uh, to make uh, bicyclists visible uh, when they're stopped at an intersection. And, and this example on the right is actually a bicycle crosswalk uh, from Skokie. So it's right alongside the pedestrian crosswalk. And in general, just thinking about conflict zones, when we went on this tour in Evanston, they've done a really great job uh, looking at how, how do you deal with both pedestrians and drivers and their interaction with bike lanes. Uh, and they really are definitely using that green paint a lot to, to make sure um, by, the, the bike lane is visible. And another example from Evanston, this is, so in many suburban communities, uh, you're, it's allowable to bike on the sidewalk. Um, so in Evanston, uh, biking is allowed in non-commercial areas. So they, they've got uh, green paint on the sidewalk area near a high school. Um, so um, bicyclists uh, can be directed up there. And then finally, just a mention about uh, near a school, having some markings to alert drivers that there could be bicyclists or pedestrians uh, going to school. And also wanted to briefly mention bike parking because, you know, you could have this great network in your community, but a lack of bike parking. Uh, so something also to advocate for, and there's definitely some great examples around the region. So Skokie, Oak Park, Richton Park are the examples shown here, and there's different styles, different types. So a lot of regional examples to draw from. And before we get into the, any Q&A, just wanted to mention two other resources. So, and I'll send these links out as well. Uh, this is a uh, recently released publication. It's Small Town and Rural Multimodal Networks from the Federal Highway Administration. It has really great examples, talks a lot about pavement markings and uh, signage and uh, other treatments that that can be added to these different types of ideas and a really great resource that's worth looking at and worth citing as as Ed mentioned when you're if you're trying to advocate for something in your community uh, and then also NACDO's Designing for All Ages and Abilities they this is a really great publication and they have this nice chart where you can look at um, so if you can find out, okay, how busy is this road? So how, how many cars are using this road? How many lanes are on this road? Um, and it's a, a flow chart to kind of help you figure out what could be an appropriate treatment for, for that road. And that is it. So I wanted to open it up to Q&A. So feel free to use the comment box um, to ask any questions and I will check my email to see if um, there are any questions from anyone. Okay, there is a question from Terry Witt. Uh, Terry, I don't know if you're still on. Um, so he's asking, riding a side path when the intersection traffic light for cars is green, but the pedestrian signal is an orange hand, what can the bicyclist do? Well, um, cross, or crosswalk laws apply to bicyclists, and um, that's a good question, Terry. Um, I, I think that I, I know that I certainly proceed in that situation, uh, assuming that you did not have the opportunity to have it uh, turn to a walk signal. Um, you know, if it's flashing, if it's flashing like a don't walk, then hurry up. Um, but if you never had the opportunity to 
to turn it to a walk signal, then I think you would go. Um, technically, legally, you may be at fault there, but I don't know. That's that's more of a Brendan Kevinitis question yeah. than me. <laughs> Uh, oh, and he had one other question. How can a shoulder on a busy road be converted into a protected bike lane? Oh, have you seen that at all? Having a shoulder um, converted into a protected bike lane? I, yeah, I haven't seen too many protected bike lane uh, conversions except you know, what Aurora did where they did a road diet. They got rid of... They got rid of a lane that they did not need, and that provided the room you need. Um, so shoulders range in width, and typically they don't, they're don't they not wider than, say, 10 feet, and even in the best of circumstances. Um, so and that what I, what I would do is I would look at the width of the shoulder you're looking at um, and then uh, go to the NACTO guide to learn what is the minimum width for the buffer, for the protected bike lane itself, and if you want to have it two-way, what's the minimum for that, and see if it's feasible. So, yes, it could be done. Um, the uh, If it's a busy road with higher speeds, there's going to be resistance to having a barrier directly adjacent to the um, uh, to the travel lanes, so you have that issue as well. So I, I, would, I would say you need more information about the situation rather than just give a blanket uh, rule of thumb. Okay, great. All right. Are there any other questions from anyone? I don't see any. Well, I think that's it. So, um, Ed, you don't have anything else to add, do you? No, no. Thanks. All right. Thanks so me. there's Ed's contact info. I'll make sure to send his contact to everyone, um, as well as all of the resources that we mentioned today. Um, and just a heads up, in September we're planning another webinar on uh, more on election advocacy since election season is coming up and we've got this bike walk fund that we're trying to push to so we can get more funding directed to biking projects, walking projects, and transit projects as well. So, um, so thank you everyone. Thank you Ed so much for taking the time to share all your knowledge with us. Um, Ed's a great resource. so. Um, definitely reach out to Ed or, or myself if you have any more questions about bikeway design. All right. Well, thank you all, and we'll we'll end end this early. So, thank you, Ed. Thanks, Maggie. Bye, everyone.